How's everyone going? Hope you guys are good. Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi. All good. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jane. Hey. Welcome to the first online version of the Meetup. Thank you for having us. Oh, yes, my thank pleasure. you. It's, it's first online for us too. We just did it on site. So let's yeah. see how it goes. Yeah. How's everyone finding working from home and stuff? It's fine after you get used to it, but still it's better at the office. Yeah, I do miss the office, but it is what it is. Hopefully we can go back yeah. sooner, in a few months. We all yeah. miss the club. <laughs> huh? What did you we say? all miss the pub. But we, pub. I think it'll be, be a few years before we get back down to the pub. I like it. I was like, yeah, who cares about the office? We're near the pub. <laughs> I like your it's thinking. Time. <laughs> Come go outside. You can't have a, no beer gardens anymore, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Brev. Hi, Ben. Oh, we got Tony. Tony, welcome back. Hey, guys. How you going? Yeah, we're good. Jen, at one point, I need to um, swap. I need to give Danny control of uh, to make him presenter. I'm not sure how to do that on Zoom. Is that? Uh, you can present. So, um, so you just I have to go my... share screen and you'll be fine. Oh, so he can just, pre okay. So Danny, it's not like go to, you just. So um, yeah. I know it's Danny's account, but it's actually my, my account. So it's fine. Okay. If that makes sense. <laughs> I'm not the Danny he's talking about. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. But yeah, you you should just be able to palm, pass it over because um, anybody yeah. can present. So anybody can speak. Anybody can share the screen. So you should be good. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> How's the weather in the UK? Uh, freezing. It's like Arctic conditions at the moment. Okay. What, what is it? It's coming to summer, but I guess it's... We, we feel the same. It's yeah. awful. I mean, you know, got as low as 17 degrees. Come on. Well, yeah, that's You're what, in that's Sydney, Danny. What are you talking about? This is, this is peaking for us. This is our... This is our the best is going to get for us, really. It's all downhill. Yeah, Just I know. Yeah, be careful. Make sure to wear sunscreen. 17 degrees, guys. Come on. <laughs> I have actually a palm, so I do know what it's like over there. <laughs> I'll get a few minutes. Uh, so, Well, we're all sitting around in silence. I, I just got a question, Danny. Is Mario joining or? No, no, I'm Mario. Oh, wait, what is it, Steve? Oh, it's my. It's on Steve account, seems oh. like. Oh, my God. Oh, now it makes sense. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> now we've got oh. Danny, Mario, and Steve. <laughs> well, let me that. I wonder why Steve um, bothered to um, turn up. He, he never bothered to turn up to presentations. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, nice Thank to meet you, Mario you slash Steve. I am um, that now. I'm, not, I'm definitely not Steve. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, we'll just give everyone a couple more minutes and then we can start. Hi, Rob. Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me it's okay? Good. Yep. Yeah. Beautiful. Lovely background. Ah, oh, can't be a future armor, mate. It's a classic. Yeah. <laughs> Very futuristic. It kind of reminds me of the Kremlin. It Ooh. looks like a future armor Kremlin. <laughs> How are you doing, Danny? I haven't spoken to you in ages, mate. 
Yeah, good. Self? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Having fun at ASIC. Writing all the uh, all the courses as they should be done. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I guess you're looking forward to being able to do them in person again at some point. Yeah, it would be nice. I, the biggest thing I've noticed is my expenses have dropped from about six or seven K a month to zero. <laughs> <laughs> relate to that. I think um, we should get started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, let's get started. I'll start with sort of the house rules and stuff. So let me see, make sure you guys are muted. Cool. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks everyone for joining today on our first Psycho Melbourne user group. Usually we do it, in, you know, in. Um, in person but given what's going on I thought I'd just do online make sure you guys share your interesting topics so who don't know me I'm Jen um, and um, I work for ASIC and I usually run those events um, I'll be your moderator for today and to, to tonight we have two speakers Mary well we have two talks one of them is from Mario and Danny from Ratio Partners and we got Rob from Psycho so just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, so one of them is today's session will be recorded. Um, so I'll send the link after the after the session to you guys, so you can all get um, get the link and have a look, or send it with you or share it with your team members. Uh, so make sure you keep on mute, and if you have any questions, please just drop them in a chat box, and I'll I'll read them out at the end. Or you guys can read them out at the end. Just make sure you keep it quiet so we don't have the um, echo nose, nose and all sorts. Um, I guess one thing I wanted to share before we start today is um, one of the exciting news that um, ASICs got. Um, so we recently launched Psycho training course and Danny's running it. And um, just want to make sure you guys are aware of it. And if you're interested, please check it out. He brought them he wrote the courses himself. Um, so I think, yeah, it would be interesting to you. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, Mario, I'll pass it on to you. And if you want to share screen, just press that button on the bottom to share screen and you should be fine. Thanks. Okay, yeah, we can see your yeah. screen. Wicked, okay. Let me just do this little thing here. Okay, so slightly marketing title, uh, but it will, it will sound less um, marketing-ish uh, as, as we go through. So the title, Sales Unleashed, Getting Cycles Rich Lead Data into the Hands of Your Sales Teams, which is a very fancy, or it sounds very fancy, but actually it's, I might go through. It's a project we've been working on for a while. It's like we, it's, it, we've noticed a trend recently with COVID-19 with agencies, either they're buying loads of Scrabble boards or they're doing loads of projects because we have more downtime. Um, so we've used, as, as obviously as most, most businesses are slightly quieter, we've used a lot of the time we've had recently to work on projects we wanted to work on for months and months. But um, like, as you all know on the call, client work always gets in the way and one of the things we always wanted to do um, is build out uh, more development tools more marketing tools and dashboards for our b2b clients i'll talk about that in a, in a second uh, i'm not going to talk about too much about who we are because i know it is uh, incredibly boring the usual logo porn from agencies but i just want to briefly touch upon a couple of things because it's relevant for the presentation uh, first, introduce myself. My name is Mario Kiriaku, and my colleague Danny, um, who's joining us from Romania. I'm dialing in from London. Danny's the head of development here at Ratio, and I am the co founder. We're um, a cycle only agency. We set up 2015. Before that, um, I spent five, five and a half ish years working at Cycle. But the reason why I wanted to show a couple of the clients. Um, before you all get too bored is here in the UK as an agency we predominantly work with 
cycle, uh, B2B clients within the cycle space, about 75% of the 25, 30 clients we've worked with over the last five, five and a bit ish years have been in the B2B space. And a lot of the tools and dashboards and things we build out is specifically with that audience in mind. Why Sitecore and B2B? I mean, Sitecore has never been marketed as a B2B platform. It has a wide uh, custom base from loads of different sectors. We know the, the, the financial services, charities, etc. But I've always felt, even from my years of working at Sitecore, that Sitecore was uniquely set up to be a B2B marketing platform even though it's not marketed at like that as if um, such as platforms like demand base, but actually a lot of the functionality within Sitecore um, resonates better with a B2B audience than it does with a B2C audience who traditionally are not really that interested in, in, in analyzing what a user does at the individual level. It's too detailed. Whereas for a B2B company, that is exactly the type of information that they want. So as I mentioned, we tend to work with B2B clients in the UK and there has been a common thread and trend across all of these in terms of the, the things that you always say to us. One, marketing is always looking to show more value to the business and that's really to get away from being seen as creating decks or just a bro static brochure where a website, which is just a shop window, they really want to be seen as driving revenue um, further down the line. And that's why I think Cycle and B2B is quite, quite valuable because in B2B, the half of the challenge is that the, the single source of truth for, for what is important to the business is never held within marketing or Cycle, all the sales data is held elsewhere. So it's really hard for marketing to show I suppose, value to the business when it's hard to quantify what marketing activity does in terms of driving things like pipeline and sales. And then the other side of that is you've got sales teams within B2B organizations who are really only interested um, in how they can drive more pipeline from new prospects, existing customers. And the question um, we get from marketing when we're talking to our clients is, how can Cycle potentially help the sales function within organize, their organizations to drive more business? So there's a couple of uh, trends. So I think one of the reasons why I think Cycle and B2B is quite good, when we work with our B2C clients, they tend to have much larger teams, much larger budgets. So within B2B, it's a much smaller marketing team. You tend to have perhaps three or four people within mid-size um, businesses in the UK who are managing the digital marketing function um, and, try, and they're busy enough doing their day jobs, let alone trying to do more, more things. Um, there's a greater focus on knowing what's happening at an individual level. I've just spotted my, my, my typo, so that's fixed that afterwards, but, uh, but which is, we can talk about a little bit more in a minute. Great emphasis on account-based selling and targeting and how you can profile and understand, you know, who's coming from a specific company. It's a bit of a tricky one at the moment because with home working, um, um, IP tracking is obviously is, 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 is a tricky thing, but obviously as businesses start gradually going back to um, their offices, if they do, obviously that, that will probably um, be um, uh, a topic of greater discussion again. Uh, and knowing what impact marketing channels play in driving sales, which is actually a really tricky one. If you don't have things like you know, attribution models, you don't have the data stitched up with pipeline and sales data. And from the sales side, it's pretty universal across whether you're a manufacturer or a membership-based organization. They're interested in how can we close more deals. Um, they, have, they tend to have longer-ish sales cycles than some of our B2C clients. So what they're looking to do is nurture prospects over a longer period of time. How do you have more relevant client conversations? And how do you prioritize, if you're generating a large volume of leads, how do you prioritize what you should be following up with you know, on a given day or week? And why Cycle? Well, we know what users are doing. This is why I think um, Cycle is more set up for B2B than it is for B2C, because of its ability to analyze at an individual level. When we've talked to clients like insurance companies, getting that granular when they have you know, one, two, three million visits a month, you know, kind of blows their minds because it's, it's too detailed. They want to have an aggregate level around segments and understand what they're doing. But from a B2B level, um, understanding profiling what a, a known individual is, is doing is super important. 
One thing I should mention is that amongst uh, the tool we've built and we're going to talk about today uh, has been most relevant for the clients that we've spoken to who either capture a lot of logged in data or use forms uh, or, uh, uh, quite intensely across their site because ultimately um, marketing obviously can retarget with personalization and you know, um, um, at an unknown level but, but really sales, relationship managers, uh, business development people really are only really interested in identifying known individuals. So this is more relevant if you're capturing known data. But why it's important because from Cycle is it, if you are capturing that, we know we can stitch up that individual with exactly what they're doing in terms of activity. And again, all the stuff I'm showing here today for these slides, um, uh, I know it's a pretty savvy Cycle audience. We've got on the call. I'm sure you've seen this type of stuff before. But we're going to be talking about how we get this this data into the hands of that that audience. So you're obviously probably fully aware of you know X profile and the fact you can capture this. But we want to talk about how we've translated that and pushed that over to a completely different audience of taking that information out. I'm sure you've seen this um, this one before. We've used this in tons of presentations. Um, the two way connection between Cycle and CRM. Obviously, I've got Dynamics here, but obviously. It could be a bunch of different systems, Salesforce, we've got a charity client using NG, dozens of different CRM systems, but Cycle I think is super powerful for stitching up the, that journey between my marketing and, and ultimately what happens in sales because we can pull um, that digital data and enrich contact records and at the, at the account level to see exactly what people are doing. And that's something which resonates more with our B2B clients than it does with B2C. The ability to proactively uh, um, change up the experience. Everyone's fully cognizant of um, Cycle's ability to um, personalize the experience. I'm not going to dwell too much on that. From our perspective, working with B2B clients, we find this super relevant because we can focus on things like account based targeting, uh, retargeting based on content consumed uh, with form data, uh, profiling them, and retarget them with something that's relevant based on um, what we've captured in that form data so with our clients we don't we probably only personalize probably a small percentage of their uh, incoming traffic but within b2b you can identify um, high value segments which is quite 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 easy to do if you have access to the, to the data and i mentioned um, earlier on i touched upon that within b2b um, and our cycle clients the nurturing process is particularly long. Um, it, can, it can vary from you know, a couple of months to a couple of years, depending on what, what product they sell. But Cycle's ability to um, profile and capture that information from a marketing side, and probably a good point to mention that I'm the, the marketing side of this conversation. Danny is the technical person. So I spent my time at Cycle working on you know, marketing campaigns, digital campaigns, where you can nurture prospects over time and actually being able to profile and understand that and from my perspective two things one um, personalized on site but, but actually from a marketer's point of view within b2b uh, email marketing trying to pull that data out of trying to understand and create segments of what content people are interested in based on their online experience so then i can create you know dozens of different nurture programs within email is is quite um, quite valuable and something get, that gets missed when we talk to clients who treat web and email as kind of two separate channels and don't really analyze the web data to try and figure out how they could be more targeted with their um, um, outbound communication with, with email So the marketers we work and we find this valuable because they can do things like account-based personalization, uh, retargeting based on previous content consumed, whether that's um, um, targeting them offline with email communication that's relevant or online personalization. Lead scoring, so one of the things we've done recently with a couple of B2B clients is create lead scoring models within either Cycle or different systems like HubSpot, but then when visitors return and um, they hit a certain lead score, it triggers personalization scenarios on site. And that's something that, we, that uh, the clients we speak with, um, um, it resonates with them and we're, we're trialing that with a couple of them. Um, enriching CRM contact records with digital data and one which um, most marketers we speak to 
until the, until we, we we go down this route. Don't actually really haven't done this before. It's progressive form capture. So you've either got two types of B two B clients: one who have the short form, or the other ones who have sales teams asking for you know thirty fields because they want to know everything about a prospect, and obviously that lowers your conversion rate. So one of the things we've seen great success with is progressive form capture, where we ask a little bit more information on subsequent visits, so we can enrich either the data within Cycle or further down the line when we've got CRM integration is that data within um, the CRM record. But B2B marketers have always been asked how they can drive more value for sales and you know, the client functions within organizations. So how we approach solving this case. So the specific use case that we've got and one we recognized um, I think early last year is Whatever you call the function, whether it's relationship managers, BDMs, client account managers, basically the, the roles within an organization that's focused on selling them into existing customers or to new business. And they're, as, a, as an audience, they're trying to understand how their prospects, their, their punters basically are interacting with their companies so they can have more targeted um, conversations. They can follow up with um, more relevant um, communication. So there's some of the challenges that we've spotted. Loads of leads. Uh, these guys are generating um, hundreds and hundreds of leads each week. Um, it can vary from some to do smaller, some to do a lot more. But it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to figure out where you prioritize your efforts, which ones should I communicate with first. Um, so you, there's that challenge. The second part is with existing customers, you need a way of being proactive with those um, um, long-term customers. So one of the things we hear about as a common complaint is from our clients' clients is they feel like um, it's a one-way um, conversation. It, they, they're picking up the phone and calling our customer or our client. Whereas our account managers that we're dealing with, they want to be able to proactively reach out to their own clients. Uh, but the challenge is knowing when, at uh, what point, and having the right information to follow up with. They want to discover new sales opportunities because they want to drive more revenue for the business and they want to tailor the conversation based on, on more on what they know about their punters. And we know this data is in cycle. Again, it's caveated by the fact that uh, a client needs to be asking the right questions in the first place to have the information in cycle. If you don't have logged in data, if you're not, you have no forms on the site, then, then obviously we're not going to be able to capture that right information, obviously you stitch it up to a, to a known person. But if we've put that in place, then we know the data is in cycle. So potentially we know that the information that you know, client um, account managers, you know, salespeople want to have on their prospects exists. It's just they just don't have access to it in a way that is uh, consume, uh, they can consume it and you know, extract a couple of insights that are genuinely useful for the day to day job. So what we've built as a tool, um, and uh, this is our version one, so we've been working on this for the last like month or so, is basically taking the X profile data, which we've, we've seen you know, from dozens of cycle um, presentations, which has always been spoken to a marketing audience, but basically taking the X profile data and putting it in the hands of a non-marketing audience. Why not just give sales teams access to Cycle. Well, we know Cycle's licensing models around um, uh, uh, additional users is a challenge, obviously it's gonna cost more money. Uh, when we speak to salespeople, the way they want the data presented is not presented in a way that's probably useful for a non-marketing um, audience within Cycle. Uh, they lack the ability to aggregate the account level, because uh, ultimately they're, they're, you, you might have four or five individuals from you know, Acme X visiting the site and it's how um, those individuals, uh, the combination of those individuals from one company are interacting with that company. Um, um, content is important for salespeople because they want to understand what you know, uh, three or four people from there are really interested in so they can kind of piece it all together. They're unable to dive deep into the data that's relevant for them. Uh, and ultimately what we want to do is reduce the friction and make it as easy as possible for that different audience who traditionally hasn't been served by Cycle to get access to something which is quite important and actually helps from our perspective as an agency to show that Cycle 
and our clients can drive value for their, um, their overall organization and for the sales function. So I'm just going to hand over to Danny and I'll briefly describe what the tool is. Um, Danny, do you want to share your screen for the demo and then I'll describe what we're going to show before you kick off the demo proper? Wicked. So what we built is a dashboard that pulls out um, some of the key information that's relevant from our some of our clients. So things like um, name, uh, company, recency for events. So when was the last interaction with them uh, or with their website and their content? The key event trigger. So things like what content was. Um, interacted with, did, were they triggered by a personalization scenario, and in, in which case, which personalization um, scenario, uh, date of when this interaction happened, and basically we, we built a dashboard to kind of pull out that, that information. Again, this is like the version one, so this is, we focused on the information that's um, most relevant for most of our, most of our clients, but we've, I'll talk about later on about how yeah. we can so basically, it. as Mario said, this is a tool for the salespeople <clears throat> to expose, uh, um, in a simple view, a data that it's relevant for them. Uh, for them, all these are known cycle contacts uh, and their interaction. As you see on the uh, the main dashboard, uh, you can see some graph here about the events, what they did, uh, the latest uh, uh, events that they trigger, uh, and then some map. Uh, and of course, all these can be uh, enhanced uh, uh, later. Uh, the, the, the tool itself, so the dashboard, is built in Vue.js uh, with material design, and then it connects uh, to Sycor Simple. It's a just custom API where we expose all these uh, uh, contacts data and their interaction, so can be easily uh, uh, be written and uh, put it in, uh, in the dashboard. So those are the two components uh, about uh, from from this tool. Um, of course, uh, data can be fed in uh, in the dashboard from other system. Uh, so we cannot just connect it to Cycle. We can connect it to uh, other CRM system that expose uh, their data uh, through the RESTful API. Uh, let's let's see what uh, the tool can do. So basically, here we have a list of contacts uh, uh, that uh, uh, access Cycle and given the details, uh, we can uh, uh, filter. We can search uh, uh, some some contacts. Uh, 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 we can search some events. Uh, so the salespeople uh, have very uh, good access to all these details. And then, of course, uh, if they uh, um, uh, want to see more details about the contact uh, just go go on the contact and then uh, uh, you see all the data about that contact the location and then the events that they trigger uh, on top of this the tool actually allows them uh, to segment all these contacts basically uh, they can assign this contact to uh, one of their clients. So basically, uh, you can enrich the contact data with some client groups. So you know that these contacts belong to this client and then you have a statistics and you have data about, uh, about them. So you can assign uh, the, the contact to a client. The same you can put uh, uh, and give more data um, for instance, you can add some lead scoring uh, to, to this contact and enrich the, the contact data with, uh, with, with custom information. Uh, the same, uh, having to know their contact, you can actually populate this uh, 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 contact information with data from other system also, since uh, uh, it's just uh, uh, everything is uh, through the API here. Um, and as you can see, uh, the events, uh, you can see the events that you trigger, you can go on the event itself and then on the event uh, you can actually see which contacts access that, uh, that event, that goal or that uh, campaign or that uh, 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 action that you set in, uh, in, in Cycle. 
so you can see how uh, um, how how much success that event have been how many uh, person actually access it and uh, uh, donate or uh, whatever goals did you set uh, on uh, on the website uh, then uh, you can manage the client list so basically as i said um, you have this client list that you want to assign contacts to the client so uh, you only have the relevant details uh, and the relevant contact and put them in uh, segments so you know which one are hot and which one uh, you need to follow and for that uh, uh, you can a salesperson create a new new client uh, and then uh, use it uh, to assign that client uh, to no contacts from uh, from a cycle. Uh, then I can show you um, a little bit and actually do a flow. Uh, let let me open um, let me open an incognito window. Uh, I will just uh, go and trigger some events on the website. I can actually uh, let's uh, fill up a form. Uh, just to see uh, that everything uh, uh, works and goes uh, in uh, in uh, in the tooling dashboard uh, um, on the fly. So whenever uh, you fill in uh, a form, all that data uh, submitted. Yes. Uh, let's let's see. Um, if the contact is uh, yes, so basically, uh, whenever a, a contact, whenever a visitor access the site and fill up the form, all that contact is automatically uh, feed uh, in uh, in in the tool, and then you as uh, uh, you as uh, 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 non cycle access people, since you don't need the cycle login to access this portal, uh, you can go and see details about it and as I said, enrich that contact with extra details that are relevant for, uh, for you. Uh, so basically that's, uh, that's the, the POC that we are working on, the version uh, uh, one, and uh, help us uh, uh, to expose all these uh, psychor data uh, to, 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 to non psychor people and what why not uh, uh, actually combine it uh, with other system uh, uh, and enrich that contact data uh, with uh, information that are relevant for uh, for us and uh, as i said uh, the the cycle part is just a custom uh, uh, api that uh, uh, connects to x connect client api and instantiate the uh, the client object and gets all the relevant data uh, for uh, to to expose and then uh, the dashboard itself it's an application that can be hosted everywhere can actually be hosted in the same cycle or can be hosted uh, anywhere since just connects uh, through through an api uh, uh, to to get the data and as i said the dashboard can be extended uh, to show other data, uh, more relevant data uh, uh, for for the salespeople without them having to connect to Sycor and try to uh, yeah understand uh, which contacts belonging to which client and uh, spending time uh, with with that. Uh, so basically, that's uh, uh, that's the the, the tool. And then, as I said, uh, uh, we use uh, uh, we use the um, XConnect client API uh, for uh, for this. And as you know, um, you can use the XConnect client API uh, in the cycle context, like we did. But in the same time, we could instantiate it in a non cycle context, uh, uh, a console application or uh, uh, .NET uh, core app or or whatever, since uh, the, the Cycle is connected, it's, uh, it's very powerful uh, and can be uh, used in in this way. And both of them, uh, yeah, are uh, uh, are powerful, depending on on the context. 
so that's uh, that uh, was uh, uh, um, the yeah all all the details about the tool, and then uh, uh, we can we can talk uh, a little later uh, about the questions if you have any questions or uh, have uh, want to uh, see more details about it. And now I will just hand over to uh, to Mario. Cheers, Danny. I mean. Um... We're collecting, we're demoing this with well, amongst our clients at the moment. And we're collecting feedback for what, how we're going to uh, iterate it going forward. Well, one of the things we're looking to do is for the client to generate loads of leads is look at how we can build a lead scoring model into the dashboard so they can then um, um, basically create reports that say uh, these are your hot leads for, you know, today or this week you know focus on these ones and they can just drill deeper into data on the clients for those ones um, triggered emails because um, um, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for people um, so obviously uh, creating a dashboard should be really easy but assuming you, you know you're super lazy we're looking to see if we can create um, uh, emails that which are triggered from the dashboard for basically when a hot prospect triggers you know action X send an email to the account owner with the latest information so they can go into the dashboard and have a look at what's going on and, and see if they could prioritize a conversation with that prospect. Um, things like we want to be able to create triggered content. Uh, um, so when those viewers are on the website, we want to be able to create emails which are triggered to the marketing emails which are triggered to those prospects based on the content they're consuming and the actions which they've taken. And eventually what we want to do is we'd love to get this data into um, almost have like a freeway process between Sitecore, CRM and, and the dashboard, but ultimately get this data into CRM so we can kind of stitch up um, pipeline and revenue data with what's happening in terms of you know, digital channels and marketing activity. So that brings us to the end. Um, hopefully um, you have a few questions. Hopefully you found it uh, uh, interesting. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Mario and Danny. It was um, a was really good um, presentation. Um, there are a couple questions came through. So one of them, um, is everything in analytics dashboard available in Sitecore for personalization? Yes, basically all the data uh, from, uh, from Sitecore are available and can be exposed in, in the tool. And then uh, all these events that are set up in Cycle, you can use them for personalization. And the tool itself actually shows if the contact per se actually access a personalization uh, event or uh, um, so all the data can be exposed. Yes, through, through XConnect uh, to, to the dashboard. Yeah, thanks Danny. What I was thinking more was the other way. So let's say you've got a contact who registers with a, a Gmail address. Um, he's assigned to a prospect, yeah. um, HSBC, for, yeah. you know, whatever, um, <clears throat> by a sales agent. Can that information then be exposed within Sitecore and used within personalization? Uh, yes, yes, because actually what we did here, we created a custom facet for the contact itself. So basically when you assign a, a, a client uh, to a, a contact, that one is stored on the contact facet and then it's available in Sitecore uh, to, uh, to see and to use that for personalization. Yeah, so all this data that you, the salesperson want to enrich from the tool like uh, the client data or other lead score. If they want to give a lead score to, um, uh, to, to, to a, a contact, all that it's available in Sitecore since uh, both ways. Uh, we use uh, uh, yeah, XConnect uh, to write and uh, uh, data to in, uh, in the custom facet for, for that contact, yeah. Okay, thank you, that's cool, <laughs> yeah. Oh, hi guys. Just wondering if you can if you can show us the in the dashboard. Was there was there an engagement value graph at the top? Uh, yes, that's based on. Let me just uh, uh, share the screen. Okay.
Yeah, so basically, uh, these uh, graphs uh, takes the data about the contact and display it, how many uh, events was triggered, in which day, basically what cycle shows in, the, uh, in their uh, uh, analytics. Uh, and we just expose some of those uh, uh, data here. And we can, as I uh, uh, said, uh, take the data and put it in a different graph and different views. Uh, since, uh, uh, yeah, Vue.js is very powerful and the team uh, uh, that we use, the material design, allows us to use all this graph very easy and including the map to just feed the data in and the map it's automatically populated uh, uh, in with, with that data. Cool. And I guess from, from some marketing teams, they like to use engagement value overall for the whole site to, I guess, track how they're doing. Um, is there any plans to introduce like alerts as that engagement value rises or falls? Uh, yes. Um, I think uh, that's Mario can tell uh, us if it's uh, on the uh, yeah. if it's on the list or not. If no, it will be on the list. Yeah, we we we've got a we've got a couple of clients who want that who have large global sales teams, um, and they generate they're on the rather large side of you know lead generation. So they want to be able to send out alerts to to people. I mean, some of them um, use different systems for lead scoring. So one will, will use HubSpot. So what we're doing there is integrating HubSpot with Sitecore. So HubSpot will do the lead scoring as opposed to Sitecore doing engagement value, but that lead score could trigger an email once a certain interaction happens. But in that case, um, we're triggering on-site personalization using the lead scoring in HubSpot. So yeah, the long-winded answer is yes, uh, we want to build that in because I think what for we what we want to have is speed um, on, in terms of response for our clients. So if we can get that information in front of them really quickly, it means they can have a super, more relevant, you know, super quick conversation with their prospects. Thanks. Any more questions, anyone? Cool. Um, feel free to send those questions through later if you guys like. Uh, well, thanks so much, um, Mary and Danny. That uh, was a um, great you. presentation. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, guys, let's take a five minute break, um, grab a drink, stretch, and then in five minutes we'll get Rob to do his part. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, everyone.
Hi guys. Are you there, Rob? Yeah, I'm here. Cool. Oh, doing? look at you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I think everyone's like using really good background. Um, let's go. One of everyone's back. Someone, someone, say something if you're back. Yeah, all good. <laughs> cool. All right. Well. I'm sure everyone had a quick break, so let's start with, um, let's continue. Rob. Okay. The floor is yours. Can you see my slides? <laughs> yes, this is great. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so Sitecore and Docker, so hot right now. Um, it's pretty hot. <laughs> the title kind of came to me first. I'm sure anyone who's been involved with Sitecore in the past year know all the community buzz that's going on with Docker. And the great thing was that it inspired me to watch Zoolander again, which is a fantastic film. Um, anyone who's watched it recently should go and um, give it another look for sure, because it still stands up the test of time. And as I watched it, I kind of realized that it almost fits in a little bit with what the story I want to tell with this. So I kind of figured, just lean into it, go all the way and see where we end up. So my name's Rob Earlham. I'm a Zoolander fan and also a site called Technical Evangelist. Um, I've been a Zoolander fan since 2001 when it was first released. And I've been working with site called Product since like 2006. So I've actually been a Zoolander fan for longer, which I learned making this, which I was surprised about. You can see a variety of different um, links on the screen there where you can find me at most of the time, really, if you want to reach out and say hello afterwards. But what do I want to cover today? Well. The first thing is basically what I don't want to cover. I'm not going to talk about what Docker is, how it works, some of the key concepts and things like that. There's heaps of content already out there. I've got a couple of videos on YouTube which will cover that for you. So I want to talk on some different topics with this really. I want to talk about Sitecore's journey to Docker, where we've come from and where we are today and where we're trying to get to. I want to talk about how you can build Docker images for Sitecore today. And then how you can integrate those images into your standard developer flow. So Sitecore's Docker journey, where have we come from? Well, it's one of my favorite quotes from Hansel here from the film, and it kind of sums up Sitecore's um, attitude to Docker from a couple of years ago. We knew what they were doing, we liked what they were doing, but they kind of did their thing, we did our thing, and there was no real support or crossover with it. And there were some good reasons for that. Um, primarily back then, support for Windows containers wasn't really as good. And we had a lot of the application split between .NET Core and the .NET full framework, which means we couldn't run entirely on Linux containers. Uh, we had to rely on some of those Windows containers, which weren't as well supported back then. Now, the application is still the same today. We still have application elements split between .NET Core and .NET Framework. But crucially, some of the key elements externally to Sitecore have changed, and that is kind of why we started this adoption process. The first thing of those is better Windows support for containers. So they have drastically been um, shrunk down in size. It's probably still not quite as small as their Linux counterparts. I don't think they ever will be, to be honest with you. But they're much smaller than they were previously, so much easier to work with. And also, there's some much better tooling that's been released by Microsoft. So better integration with Visual Studio, with VS Code, and some other tools that I'll show you in a little while. But the main reason that this adoption happened is because of the amazing Sitecore community. Um, a couple of partners, they basically drove this. They wanted to run Sitecore in containers, so they did. They created some open source repositories showing how you could build images based on Sitecore and deploy that out through your entire dev flow. And it was amazing work. So we ended up working really closely with them. Uh, we set up what is now the public Docker images repository. And that will show you how you can actually build Sitecore images today. So let's start to take a look at that. So when you download the Docker Images repository, what you're basically going to get is a PowerShell script and heaps of configuration files. And the main script you're going to work with is what's called the build.ps1 script. Now, the build.ps1 script is kind of like the main entry point for the repository, and it controls the build process for all of the images that you want to build. And there's a series of parameters that you pass into it. The first two are the only mandatory parameters, and they're your Sitecore username and password for dev.sitecore.com, where you download the Sitecore assets from. 
The reason you need to enter those is the first thing that the build script's gonna do is it's gonna go over to dev.sitecore and it's gonna pull down all the WDPs, which you usually, you usually use to build to your local host. And it's gonna basically pull them apart to build out the Sitecore Docker images. After that, we have a series of optional parameters which basically controls what gets built and how they get built. So things like the Sitecore version, by default, if you don't set any value for that, it'll just build the latest version, Sitecore 9.3. But we have instructions in there to build Sitecore Docker images all the way back to, I think it's 9.02, in, in, back that far. <clears throat> Topology refers to our product set. So you can build images for XM, for XP, and even XC as well. And again, that's a multi-select, so you can choose to build just one of those or, or all three. The Windows version refers to the base image that those are gonna be based off, which is provided by Microsoft. So I think it's long terms LTSC 2019 is the default one it uses, but you need to make sure that matches up to the Windows version that you're actually running as well, because you can go run into some weird issues if you don't. The next couple are all are what known as switch parameters. And that's basically a true false toggle. So you can basically select to build images containing Cycle PowerShell extensions, which is the SPE one. You can build images including Sitecore Experience Accelerator, the SXA parameter, and also JavaScript services, the JSS one. We do have some images which are marked as experimental. Uh, they're the ones based off things like the publishing service, and they haven't been tested quite as well as the others. So they come under the include experimental flag. Now, this whole build process, I'm not gonna lie to you, it can take quite a while. <laughs> I'm talking like multiple hours to actually complete. So, what we have is we have this skip existing parameter, um, skip existing image parameter. And what that does is basically it tells it not to try and rebuild any images you already have on your machine. That's really handy if you've already built, say, for example, XM and XP, and then you realize you need to build XC as well. You don't want to have to go through that all, all the same build process again for the other two. So you can just tell the script to skip over those, use the ones you've already got, just build the missing ones. The final one is the registry parameter. So as I mentioned, you, this can take like several hours to like build all these images out. It's a really long process. So if you're working on a dev team, you don't want each of your developers to go through that process. It's going to be a massive time sink for your um, department as a whole. So a registry is a way that you can get around that. So how does it work? Well, you have your team of awesome developers here, all a little crazy as most dev teams are. And um, basically, instead of all the developers building the images themselves, you use what's called a shared registry. And there's a load of different ones out there. Hub.docker.com is probably the most commonly used one. Um, Microsoft Azure Container Registries is a commonly used one. AWS have their version as well. And the advantage here is that one, one person performs the build. They push those images out to the registry. And then all the other developers just pull the images down from there. So it saves a lot of time. You could even have a build server do the build itself if you wanted to. So it could run through the night. And then it's just ready for your developers in the morning. So... Let's take a look at some of this in action. Okay. Um, what should we go first? I'll tell you what, let's go and take a look at the Docker Images repo. So I'm just going to Google Sitecore Docker Images. And whenever I present, my typing always goes to awful. So <laughs> let's see how bad it gets. So when you Google it, the first result you'll see is the Sitecore Docker Images repository. Um, and it's still super active. You can see the last commit was 15 days ago by Bart Plasmire of my team. Um, yeah, and it's basically, it's a combined set of resources that's been produced by Sitecore resources and also the community. It's a really collaborative approach. Um, you can see the build.ps1 script I just talked about here. And if you scroll down, you get pretty detailed instructions on, the, for example, how it, the images are all tagged uh, and how to get yourself up and running, how to execute that build script, passing in your username and password, how to execute it for specific different Sitecore versions, and some various other prerequisites, maybe about sending automated builds and the like. So when you've cloned that down, it ends up in your, um, on your hard disk. So if I open up Windows Explorer, you see the same instances that we just saw there in GitHub. And I just wanna focus on its packages folder. So as I said, the first thing the script does is to download all of the assets that it needs from dev.sitecore to build all of these different um, images for you. So there's heaps of things it has to download. It's like, I had it all, yeah, it's like two and a half gig in size. Um, I don't know why, but I find when running that in PowerShell, it seems to download slower than if I was doing it through the browser. So if you have those already on disk, what you can do is you can just manually copy them into the packages folder 
and it'll save you a good like 30, 40 minutes of build time at the start of the script. So handy thing to know. Um, okay, so let's take a look at this in the CLI. So let's go back to that directory. Docker images. Okay, so this is that same folder, the same, um, the same assets that I just showed you. I want to build this, but I also want to push it out to a container registry. I want to push it out to a registry to be shared by the rest of my dev team. Um, so let's show you the registry before we do that. So I'm going to hop over to the Azure portal. And I'm going to use Azure container registries because I love Azure. They've got some fantastic features in there. And it's a really nice integration with their CLI as well. So I'm going to log in. And as I said, a lot of this build process takes quite a while. So a lot of these actions I've kind of performed already. But I'm just going to show you up to the point where I would execute it. So here is an Azure container registry that I created earlier. You can see I've called it Rob SC images. And the thing we're going to need to build it from, we need to copy this login server because that's going to be the URL that we're going to use to actually push out to from the CLI. So I'm just going to copy that. And then we'll hop back to the CLI again. So the first thing I need to do is I need to log into Azure using the Azure CLI. So that's that easy, AZ login. And what that's basically going to do is it's going to tie my PowerShell window here to my subscription that I just logged in with. Uh, let me pick the right one again. OK, it says you've logged into Microsoft Azure. You can close this window. So let's get rid of that. And yeah, PowerShell is now going to make the connection to that. It's going to enumerate all the different subscriptions which I have access to and basically allow me to interact with all the different resources that I've got created in Azure. OK, so that's pretty good. Um, the next thing I need to do is I need to log into the actual container registry itself because I may have multiple different container registries in there. So we're going to use the Azure CLI again, so AZ. Then we use ACR for Azure Container Registries. Login, because we want to log into that registry. And then we're just going to give it the name, which was Rob SC Images. We don't need the whole URL quite yet. We just need the name of the actual ACR instance here. And this is now going to tie my PowerShell window once more <coughs> to my Azure account and also that specific Azure container registry within that. <clears throat> okay, sweet, I think we're good to go. So now we'd be able to build and push our images. So we could run build.ps1, and I can pass in my registry parameter. I can paste my Azure container registry URL that we just copied. I could hit enter, and then it would prompt me for my site called username and password, and it would go off and it would build all of those different images for me. As I said, that takes you know, several hours to complete, and I've only got 30 minutes. So luckily, I have done that ahead of time. Um, if we hop back to the Azure portal, then <clears throat> we can go and use this repository section here. And this will show you all the images which I've built, and I have available in that. And you can see we have ones for a, a content delivery instance for XC. We have, if we scroll down a bit more, let's get past the XC ones. Uh, I think it's because I've highlighted it, maybe. What have we got down here? Oh, we've got some XM ones down here. So this, for example, is an XM instance with SXA installed and a content delivery. And we've got things like XP. So we've got an XP standalone, which is a content management instance, um, JSS instances, all our XConnect instances, basically all the different application elements you're used to working with, just represented in this registry in like Docker image format. Okay. So that's awesome. We've got our images built. That's like most of the battle won. But we need a way to actually use them. We need to integrate them into our development flow. So that's kind of the key thing that I wanted to show here. How can you actually take those images, integrate them with your development flow, and start really getting some of the benefits that you see when working with Docker? Well, what do we need to do that? We need a few things. I'm going to need a GitHub repository. I need a source control system to store everything that I'm working with. Uh, I'm going to need to figure out what it is I want to stand up. For this example, I'm going to stand up an XP instance with SXA installed as well. I'm going to need a Visual Studio solution. I'm going to have some code in there. I'm a developer. That's what I do. I write code. So I'm going to need an IDE to write it in and somewhere to store it. I'm going to need to serialize my content items. So this is all standard site core work. Like this is what we do every day when a site core instance is installed on our host. It's not really much different when working in Docker. That's the great thing. <clears throat> And well, I need to actually start to debug it after that. Oh, no, sorry, what am I going to stand up first? That's what I was going to show you. Yeah, so we're going to have a series of images that are stored. So 
these are all going to be based on different base images. For example, we've got some images that will be based on the ASP.NET 4.8 Windows Server Core, one provided by Microsoft. We have some which just need the runtime image provided by Microsoft. We have an open JDK base image, and we're going to use the base SQL Server image, again, provided by Microsoft. So I'm going to have some SXA specific images that I'm going to create. I'm going to have an SXA specific SQL dev image. So that's going to take the standard XP SQL dev image, and it's going to have the SXA items installed as well. Similar with the XP and the standalone, which, as I said, is the CM. They're going to be the base XP images, but they're going to have the SXA file assets contained in there as well. Same with Solar. We're going to have the base XP um, Solar instances, <clears throat> but alongside that, we're going to have the SXA assets installed in there. Then we have some standard XP ones. SXA doesn't touch XConnect. It's kind of separate to that. So we're just going to use the out-of-the-box um, XConnect XP images. Okay, so we've created these containers and these images. How do we work with them? How do we deploy our custom code into the container? How do we verify the deployment was successful? How do we view the log files to see if there's any errors? And how can we debug our system to see if there, um, to, to fix any code errors there might be? I would love to think that I write perfect code first time every time, but anyone who's worked with me knows that is not true. <laughs> <coughs> So we're gonna need a development flow. And that's gonna include a few different things. We're gonna need a way to stand up all of these containers in a reliable, repeatable way. I don't wanna stand up my containers in one way and then have another teammate stand them up in a different way because we're not comparing apples to apples in that way. Um, so we're gonna use a system called Docker Compose, which gives you a YAML file to basically define how to stand up your containers in a repeatable manner. So you're all working or singing off the same hymn sheet as they say. I'm gonna use a product called Whale Names, which is gonna basically map my um, container names into my host file. And I'll kind of talk you through that in a little bit shortly. We're gonna use volumes to map key data items out of those containers into my host machine to allow me to work with it on repeated days without having to recreate that every time. And as I said, I'm gonna use TDS for my configuration and serialization management. But I'm gonna need a debugging flow as well. Uh, I'm going to basically, there's a couple of different ways to do debugging with containers at the minute. If you're on an older version of Visual Studio, you'll need to install the remote debugging application and map that in with a volume, and I'll show you that. If you're on the latest versions of Visual Studio 2019, so on 16.5 and above, you don't need to do that. And it's, it's really nice how they've set it up. So let's take a look at some of this in action. Um, I'll tell you what, let's take a look at our actual site first. What are we working with? So here is the site that we're working with. It's got some, a list of some of the characters out of Zoolander, uh, the actors who played them, an amusing quote, and a link that says it goes somewhere, but doesn't actually go anywhere. Pretty standard site called site, really. There's nothing too fancy here. Um, it's all just content. It's all content built on SXA. If we take a look at the back end, uh, let's just, I'm gonna have to log in again. So let's go into the content editor. What you'll see is it's just a standard SXA site. There's nothing fancy about it. Um, it's just basic content, really. Probably should have warmed up the content editor before uh, we got to here. <clears throat> There's a solution behind it, as I said, which basically contains a couple of um, features in a Helix style um, solution. So let's go and say, ah, here we go, it's loaded up. Yeah, so we have our Zoolander tenant. Uh, I can expand that out. I have my So Hot Right Now site. And that's it. The, there's just one homepage on there, which I showed you. And then we have some data items in here. We've got some custom data items as the cast list. So you can see that data I just showed you mapped out as a site core item. Pulling an image out of the media library. <clears throat> as I said, all just really standard site core stuff. So I'll tell you, let's go and take a look over at the CLI first. As I said, I've got all of this running ahead of time. So... Uh, yeah, so if I do docker ps a, that's going to show me all of my active containers on my system. So we can see I have a container up here for XConnect automation. I have a container for my XConnect processing engine. I have my SXA standalone, which, as I said, is the CM instance. I have my content delivery instance, my XConnect site. I have my index worker, uh, my SQL server instance. And I have my solar instance as well. 
Um, we can see here we've also got some ports mapped. So what this is saying here is port 44001 on my host machine is mapped into port 80 inside the container. So if I go to port 4401 or localhost 4401, it'll get piped through to port 80 in the container and will render out whatever is showing on port 80, which is IIS in the container. So that gives you a way to actually hit those sites within your browser. If you were paying attention before though, I didn't actually do that. What I've done here is, as I said, I'm using a tool called whale names and it means you can just use like really friendly domain names. So I can use CD to access the CD and probably using one instance. I can use CM to access the CM. And it all comes from this program called Whale Names, which I've got running in another tab here. This is a Node.js program, <clears throat> which basically you just run this one command and then it just sits in the background and it writes a series of key entries into your host file. Uh, if I bring that up. So what it, basically when you create a container at the start, it's assigned a unique IP address. So this is my host file. You can see heaps of other stuff in here. But you get this section at the bottom, which is this dynamically generated whale name section. And each of these containers, as I said, are each given a dynamic IP when they're first booted up. So you can see they're all here. And if we take CM, that's a great example. What it says here is I'm going to map this IP here, which I can hit. And I'm going to give it a series of different domain names, which whale names has picked out for me. The first one is the ID that's automatically generated by Docker when you create a container. So that's not too useful, but it's in there. Um, this is the one that's really helpful. This is the name of the container within the Docker Compose file that I'll show you shortly. So CM for CM, CD for CD, makes it really simple for here. You also get this um, hugely long generated one at the end. Um, and this is basically a combination of the folder that it's running in, which is what the project name is in Docker. And then you get the name of the container within the Docker file. And then you get an instance number. Let's not change that. Um, yeah, you get an instance number because it's possible also using Docker Compose to scale these. So you can automatically scale your CM out to multiple instances if you want to. And then you'd end up with the next one with the number two on there, for example. Okay, so I think it's time we looked at some code. Let's hop over to Visual Studio. So this is the solution that I, well, it's just powering the site that I just showed you. And it's pretty standard Helix stuff. Um, I've got a couple of modules, as I said. I've got a project module and a feature module. We'll start with the feature one. This is basically that cast list, which I just showed you. So we have a razor view in here. Um, <clears throat> this is a controller rendering. And anyone who's built an SXA controller rendering recently, this will look very familiar to you because you build it in exactly the way working with Docker as you would do if, installed, if it's installed on your host. So I have my uh, razor view in here. I have a service in here to bind up all the references through my IOC container. I have a repository, which is responsible for building my data model. It basically just um, pulls out all of those cast members that I just um, showed you. I have the model items themselves, um, the controller, not too much going on in there. But yeah, pretty standard SXA stuff. Nothing groundbreaking, nothing revolutionary, nothing Docker specific. And that's the key really. It's just cycle specific, not Docker specific. I've got some content items for that. I mentioned I'm using TDS, so the templates which are used for those data items and the rendering as well. I can step down to the project layer and it's pretty much the same. Um, my project's actual code files really light. Um, it's got a CSS file with about literally four lines of CSS in it. Um, <clears throat> and then I've got most of the items in here are part of my TDS project. So I have my templates, all the media items, those images that you saw. Um, all of those stored in TDS. Again, exactly the same way as you would store them when working with um, when working with your items locally, as compared to working with a Docker container. So this all looks very familiar, but obviously there's got to be some way of getting these assets into my container. I said before, <clears throat> excuse me, that I basically stored up images from that Docker images repository, which I did. Those images do not contain this code by default, obviously. They just contain empty site core. So how do I get my code here and my content items into those containers and, and make it run, like make, make the magic happen? <laughs> well, to show that, I kind of want to start to show Docker Compose for a minute and show how you actually stand up these images. So <clears throat> as I said before, Docker Compose is basically um, kind of like a manifest in a way for what containers are going to be created, 
how they're going to be created, what images are going to be used to build them, any specific like memory limits for how much resources they can use. There's everything you want to configure about a con container you put into here, and then it makes it reproducible. So when I create my container, it's created in the same way as person A, person B, person C on my team. It's all the same. Um, so if you look in here, we have our services node, and beneath there, we basically get a node for every container that we want to create. So if we start off, we can see I have my SQL node first. And you can see it's pulling down my um, SQL dev image. <coughs> and I have a volume mapped in here. What that basically means is it's gonna store my SQL data outside of the container in a folder on my host machine. And this is what's known as a named volume. So I don't provide Docker with a specific location on disk. There are, there are ways to do that. Um, I prefer to work in this way. I basically just give it a name of data SQL. And I'm just saying to Docker, right, I want you to take all this data that's usually in C data in my container and store it somewhere on my host machine, call it data SQL and you handle that for me. I don't care where you put it. That's not my concern. Just take it outside of the container. Containers by their nature are very ephemeral. They're designed to be taken down, stood up again. So you don't want to persist any important data inside it because when they're destroyed and rebuilt, you'll lose all that. So things like SQL data, solar data, logs, all those important key pieces of data, you want to pipe those out external to the container. And that's exactly what we're doing here. I mentioned before about port mapping. This is how we map up the ports. So 44010 is, uh, will be mapped from my host machine into my SQL container. And then we have some environment variables like the SQL password and the EULA. Solar is very similar. We have a volume for my solar directory. Uh, again, very similar setup, different port mapping, obviously. XConnect, I'm gonna kind of skip over. I don't really do much special with the XConnect instances. Um, I wanna focus more on the CD and CM because that's where some interesting stuff starts to happen. We have the port mapping, as I said, so CD is 44002. Then we have a heap of environment variables, which is how we set key configuration settings inside the container. When you download the Docker images container um, for the first time, when you run it by default out of there, using the example Docker compose files they have, you need to store your license information in an environment variable with a PowerShell script that they provide for you. Well, I forgot to do that pretty much every single time I ran the containers, much to my annoyance. <laughs> um, so what I started doing instead was something that uh, Michael West showed me. Um, he basically showed me, you can just map, uh, well, you set an environment variable to be a location inside the container first. So this is the file that's system inside the container, C license, license.xml. And what it's saying here is, go and get your license from there. And then all I do is I map a volume to a specific location on my hard drive this time. And that's where my license file lives on my disk. So when the container starts up, the license file will be shared from my host machine into my container and I don't have to worry about setting that environment variable. Um, what else do we have in here? So some other key ones, yes. Um, I mentioned a remote debugger before. If you're using an older version of um, Visual Studio, then you'll have a remote debugger at some kind of location like this on your machine. And you basically map that in to see remote debugger. And that's how you can wire up debugging functionality on older versions of Visual Studio. It's not required on newer ones though. <clears throat> the other key thing though, is what I mentioned a minute ago. How do I get my files in there? We've still not covered that. Um, this all comes from these entry points. So I haven't really touched on entry points yet, but what an entry point is, is it's a way of allowing you to execute a command inside of a container. And if you use it within a Docker Compose file like this, it means you can execute it on startup. So here we're executing a PowerShell command and we're gonna execute this specific PowerShell script called development.ps1, which exists at this tools entry points. And this is part of what is built by those Docker images containers. It's part of one of the assets that's provided by, provided by that. And this um, development script gives some key functionality. It basically, first of all, changes all your logging. So normally Sitecore logs to disk in the app data folder nowadays. But as I, as I mentioned, that's not very good practice when you're working with Docker. Um, if you have a problem with your container and it dies, you're gonna lose all those log files. So you, your debugging process and your, like, um, your process of figuring out what went on is gonna be much more difficult. So what this script does is it changes the log files to be piped to standard out instead. <clears throat> and then you can use a heap of industry standing tooling just to basically pick up those log files directly. The other key thing it does is to enable some deployment functionality. 
And that is based around this um, deploy volume that I've mapped in here. Basically, anytime you map in somewhere to this C colon source directory within the container, if that exists on startup, this is gonna start basically watching that folder. And any files that you drop into that source directory, it will copy them over directly into the www root folder. So that's how your deployment process basically works. So I have a deploy folder at the root of this solution. And then basically if I wanna deploy my feature project, I push the files into that deploy folder. They are then volumed into the source directory. And from the source directory, the watch script copies them into the www root directory. <clears throat> and that is how the deployed files basically make their way through to the actually active site core instance. And it's much the same in the CM instance. There's not really too much difference. That works on much the same principle. Um, oh, TDS, that was one other thing I didn't show you, yeah. So item serialization. So I'm assuming most of you used TDS before, you've configured it um, to run from a site core instance install on your host. It's pretty much exactly the same with the container. All I've done here instead is I've pointed it to that deploy folder I just talked about within my solution. The key thing you've got to remember is you've got to tick this enable container deployment checkbox. Um, basically, if you don't check that, uh, when you're working locally on your host, the first thing TDS does when you try and deploy is it'll check that deploy folder and it'll look for DLLs and configs and things like this to make sure it's actually a site core instance that you're trying to push the connector out to. Checking this checkbox basically disables that check. You're basically just saying, look, trust me, I know what I'm doing. It may not look like a site core folder that I'm deploying to, but it's gonna end up in the right location. So you can hit the test button and it just works exactly the same. The connector has been deployed and it gets piped through into the, um, into the correct double root folder. And then TDS just works as normal. I can just go sync with Sitecore and it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same flow for serializing your items in and out as when it's deployed on your host. So if we just take a look at that deploy folder, that's probably a good idea. Um, Where's that? It's in here somewhere. Yeah, so this is the solution I was just working out of. And yeah, you can see I've got this deploy folder. So this is everything that gets pushed out of there. The underscore dev folder is the TDS connector. And then I have things like my app configs, my configs for my feature, um, that razor view that we looked at before is in here. And there should be a couple of binaries as well. Yeah, basically everything that I need out of this solution that I need to be copied into, um, into the actual site for it to run. Okay, so we've done code, we've done serialization, we've done Docker. Yeah, I think that covers like the development side of things. Um, you can see basically how when I'm working in Visual Studio, it's exactly the same as working on the host, as I, as I keep saying. Um, there's, there's no real day-to-day -day difference once you've got it all set up, but you get all the benefits of Docker when you're developing. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is debugging, because that's, that's the other side of development, isn't it? We unfortunately write bugs and we have to get rid of them. So... Let's just close these down. So with the later versions of Visual Studio, you've got this awesome containers window. So I'm gonna get rid of that. I'm gonna get rid of that warning. Um, and this basically now lists all of my active containers. And it looks like my automation engine one's exited, but luckily I don't need it for this demo, so we're okay. Um, so let's take a look at my CD one first. And you get some really, really nice integration here. So here's all those environment variables I just talked about. Um, so here's the things like all the different connection strings to connect through to the sequence that I created, how to get to solar, that license variable, which I talked about telling uh, Cycle where to find its license file. We can see the ports that were mapped in. This is a really handy one. So remember I said before that the Cycle logs are now all output to the standard out. Well, that means that basically we can stream the logs now directly in Visual Studio. So it's really nice and oh God, what's going on here? And I can see that I have heaps of X-Connect errors. Awesome, that's what you wanna see. <laughs> um, we also get this files window, which is fantastic. This is really handy. Previously, if you wanted to view the file system in a container, um, you could do it through the command prompt, through PowerShell or the like. And it's, it's not too hard, but it are a few commands you've got to do to exec into the Docker container. And then you've got a very textual interface to view the files, which isn't everyone's cup of tea. So this is a much easier explorer style interface. Um, and we can see here, so for example, there's that source directory. So remember I said that my deploy directory is mapped as a source directory inside the container. So here's those same assets we just saw. We can see the TDS connector in there. Uh, we can see the binaries that I copied in there. 
And if you remember, I said that when that exists, that basically starts a watch directory PowerShell script, which is going to take all those files from my source directory and copy them directly into my double root folder in inet pull. So we can go and double check that's there. So if we expand this, we can see, ah, here we go. So my TDS connector's in there. It's copied that in for me. Uh, I can go and check the binaries. This might be a little slow. There's a few in there. Um, oh, phew, it didn't load, it loaded. Uh, ah, here's my feature. I can see that in there. So this gives you a really easy way to check that that deployment flow is actually working and make sure there's no errors with that when you're actually, without even having to leave your IDE, basically. Um, the key thing, though, that I wanted to show you here is the debugging functionality. Uh, anyone who saw my session at Global Subcon will realize that this demo failed on me then. So it worked early on today, so I'm crossing my fingers here. <laughs> Basically, what this is hopefully going to do now is go over to my CD container, which I right-clicked on, and it's going to enumerate all of the actual processes that are running inside of that. So I can then go and attach to one of those processes in pretty much exactly the same way that I would do with all of the processes running on my host machine. It does take a little bit of time to go and connect through them all. Um, it's a pretty new feature with Visual Studio. So hopefully it's going to work. We will wait and see. Come on. There's a couple of things you've got to remember with this. Oh, it works. Fantastic. <laughs> so yeah, there are a couple of things you've got to remember. Um, if you, with the code type here, if you have it set to automatic, for some reason it doesn't work. It won't actually hit any breakpoints for some reason. So you've got to basically manually go and check the type of code you want to debug yourself. That's not too great a pain. So I can go through, I can show processes for more users. And then we scroll down and we get our W3WP process. Um, I'm going to sound a bit like a broken record here, but it is just exactly the same as when you work locally. So I can go there and I can attach to that IIS process inside my container. And we can see that I've got my debugging view here. So if we hop back to the browser and my CD instance, and I refresh the page, I hopefully had a breakpoint open somewhere. Yes, here we go. Um, we can see I've hit the breakpoint in my controller. Um, exactly the same debugging functionality that you see when working locally. My call stack's there with all of the executions that have happened. I've got my local window here. I can go and dig into all of the active properties that are currently um, available in my controller. So you can see you basically have pretty much the same development flow and debugging flow that you have when working with a host. Okay, Whew. we've caught quite a bit there. <laughs> um, I do want to finish with a couple of closing thoughts. And this is kind of like somewhere I see this really shining and people getting real benefit around this. And kind of a lot of these are around, definitely on the partner and customer side. Um, coming from a partner myself, I, I, I switch client projects pretty regularly. And the typical approach for that is usually having a VM for each. VMs are super heavy. You, can, you can't fit too many on your machine. You have to copy them off onto an external hard drive, things like this. It's pretty painful. Um, being able to run these out of container images, so much more lightweight, so much quicker to stand up an image, tear it down, blow it away off your hard disk, and then pull it down from a registry again, if you like. So yeah, context switching between client projects is going to be so much easier. And that kind of ties into switching between site core versions. The reason you can't have multiple client projects installed on your host machine is usually because they're all on different cycle versions, which means they all need different versions of SQL Server, they all need different versions of Solo running, and they can tread on each other's toes quite a lot. So the fact you end up with containers for, as I say, SQL, Solar, all your Sitecore instances, it's all contained and off the host machine. The host machine is really clean. It means, yeah, you can context switch between complete versions really, really quickly. And one of the key things that I think about this um, is around the upgrade side. If you were working on a project previously and doing a major upgrade, I mean, say from like version eight to version nine, then you're going to have to probably upgrade SQL. You're going to have to probably upgrade Solar. And if you're running directly off your host, or if you're running on a VM on your host, then at that point, at some point, you're going to have to uninstall those old versions, install the new ones. And at that point, your VM is kind of in an unworkable state. You have like mismatched versions of SQL, Solar, and the code base. If at that point you end up with a production issue, let's say, and you need, to, um, you need to get down master, you need to work with that to get a fix, you're going to be in a real uh, a bit of a state. You're going to have to revert all those SQL instances, solo instances back. With Docker, you can do all of it on a branch. You can do the whole thing on a branch. And if, you're, if you do run into that issue, you need to switch back and work off master again. 
it's easy to do. You just basically check out the other master branch, stand up the other containers instead, and you're back in business. So the isolation and like the, the containerization and the, the names there, um, really, really beneficial. Whew. So I kind of went pretty fast there. I covered a lot. Um, hopefully that has shown you why Site and Docker is so hot right now. Um, there's a couple of links I also wanted to get up on screen for you. Uh, I mentioned at the start that I have a couple of videos going over some of the key Docker concepts around how Docker works under the hood and how to get those images stood up in a bit more detail. And you can see both of those on YouTube. Um, if you look at the GitHub repository links below, the top one is the link for that, um, the Visual Studio solution I just showed you. So that's got everything you need to basically show you exactly what I just showed you there. You can check that out. Um, you'd have to build the images yourself. Obviously, you can't access my container registry. But um, if you use the link below that, you can build your own images. And away you go. Okay. Thanks for listening to me prattle on about Zoolander and Docker for a while. <laughs> Does Thanks. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> it is very hot right now. It is. <laughs> yeah, awesome, awesome presentation. Uh, was um, I love the theme. <laughs> Thank who, does, you. who doesn't like the Zoolander? Um, anyway, so any uh, there's a couple of questions came through, but before I go with them, anyone anyone's got any questions? Yeah, I've got one if I may. Rob, would you be able to to talk a little bit around um, minimum specs for dev machines, particularly like? Um, if you need to do any work with commerce. Yeah, so commerce is obviously heavier. There's more application instances involved. Um, but as I said, like if you've got a machine that can run uh, Sitecore on a host today, uh, on your host today, then you'll be able to run Docker on that. If you're running your host and a VM on top, that's way heavier than anything you're going to run in Docker. So, like, I mean, you probably 16 gig of RAM, you'd probably be looking at, I think, as a minimum. You could probably get away with eight maybe, but it's, it's going to be chugging along a bit. But they're pretty standard specs for a dev machine nowadays. Cool, thanks. Um, one other thing as well, sorry. Uh, what, um, uh, what isolation, uh, sorry, is it, is it process or are you running Hyper-V on these containers? Or So my work machine is only on Windows version 1903. So I do not have access to process isolation yet. Um, cause that came in in 1909. So I'm running Hyper-V. Okay, cool. Thanks. Hey Rob, outside of Psycho, I've heard of people using Docker images in production. Has anyone been crazy enough to try that? Yes, we do have some customers who are running it in production today and they've been running it in production for quite a while. So I mentioned those partners previously who basically started this whole thing off. Um, they, they've had multiple projects and partners, customers, sorry, who have gone live in production with Docker. There are people doing it. Nice, and are they, I guess they're using scaling with Docker then as well? What was that, sorry? Are they, are they using like to, I don't know, multiple Docker images to scale as well in production? Yes, so most of the times you'd run it in something like Kubernetes, and that'd handle basically standing up, like for example, like multiple instances of your CD image, load balancing across those, in the same way you would do if you were just running it in PaaS or something like that. Nice, okay, thanks. Okay, so the question that came through um, is, will Psycho be issuing any pre-built images in the future or will the community have to continue to build their own? Yes, we are definitely issuing images in the future for sure. Um, as I kind of mentioned at the start, we're, we're on our Jocker journey at the minute. Um, we, we've, we've started having no support at all and we, we're, we're slowly progressing along it. Where we're at currently with 9.3 is that you have to build your own images from the Docker images repository. In the future, we're definitely going to be issuing pre-built images. Um, we just need to get ourselves lined up to be able to do that efficiently and make sure we do it in the right way really first. But yeah, definitely on our roadmap, you'll be seeing them pretty soon, hopefully. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, any more questions, anyone? Feel free to send them through later if you guys like. Um, on that note, Rob, would you like to add anything else before we wrap up? No, I think I got up pretty easy there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. It was just like bam, bam, bam. All done. <laughs> Nothing foul, like you said. Um, anyway, so thanks everyone for joining today. I really appreciate it. It's our um, 
first online meetup. I'm not really sure what's going to happen to the next one. Possibly it's going to be online again, but I think this was great. I um, really appreciate you guys joining. Um, and yeah, see you guys next time. And thanks so much, Rob and Mara and Danny for presenting today. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.